Hi, everyone. Um, since it is um, shortly after noon and we have a great program to get started today, I um, thought I would um, kick us off. Um, my name is Lacey. I am the Administrative and Program Coordinator for the California Association of Museums. We are so grateful to all of you for joining us today in our last program of our ReMuseum series. So thanks for being here. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping um, notes. This program is being recorded and it will be posted to YouTube following the session. And uh, closed captioning is provided. You can, um, you can see the captions embedded in Zoom or in a separate window. I'll share that link in the chat box. And if you have any questions or issues um, during the program today, please feel free to message me using the chat box or send me an email at admin at calmuseums.org and I will do my best to help you out. Um, so uh, now I'm going to pass it off to Tomoko Kuta, the chair of CAM's program committee to introduce today's program. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lacey. And it is amazing. We are on session number nine of this Reed Museum series. And so if you've missed any of the previous ones, please go to CAM's website and you'll find a link to the YouTube videos of all the previous eight sessions. Um, they've all been fantastic. So um, as we begin this event, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. And land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with native communities to secure a meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. We honor and are grateful for the land we occupy and recognize the ongoing damage of settler colonialism. Let's take a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. I am on the traditional territory of the Kumeyaay peoples I encourage you to name and acknowledge the native peoples where you are located in the chat box. On behalf of the program committee, I'd like to welcome you all to this ReMuseum program. Recover, reimagine, revive. What does ReMuseum mean to you? Thank you for joining today's virtual conversation to delve deeply into the challenges that the museum field is facing and how our field can move forward. So throughout the series, members of the program committee have been in dialogue with special guests who have knowledge or experience to help us consider new perspectives and explore new directions for our field. Let me remind you that CAM has a board approved code of conduct for participation in our programs. A link was sent to you in the confirmation for this program, but Lacey is also going to paste a link in the chat box for your convenience. CAM is committed to providing a safe, inclusive, and respectful learning and networking experience for everyone. So now I'd like to shift to today's session and give a brief introduction. And I'll start with a question. How has this unprecedented year changed our vision for the role, of mu for the role that museums play in our lives and what positive takeaways can we harness as we move past pandemic and into the new normal? We have three speakers today. I'm going to introduce Nicole Medall. She is the CAM. She's a CAM program um, committee member. She's also the executive director of Western Neighborhoods Project, a community history nonprofit focused on the west side of San Francisco, which also manages an online archive of historical images called Open SF History. And I believe she's dropping in some uh, links or Lacey's dropping in some links into the chat box so you can check out her organization. Our second speaker is John Echevesti, who is CEO of, La, of LA Plaza de Cultura y Artes, the only museum in the country dedicated to the history, art and culture of Mexicans and Mexican Americans. And there's also now a link in the chat box for his organization. And our special guest today is Anthea Hartig. She is the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, the first woman to hold that position. And you will now find some links to her organization. So that, with that, I'd like to turn the session over to uh, Nicole to kick off the session. Thanks so much. 
that wonderful introduction to MoCo. And of course, thank you to Cam for hosting us. Um, it's been such a pleasure to pull this a session together and to work with everyone here. Um, just really quickly before we begin, I wanted to address feedback, asking Cam to provide programs relevant to small and rural organizations. And as full disclosure, my organization might be located in one of the wealthiest cities in California and the, and the nation and probably the world. Um, but it is a tiny nonprofit and I'm the only employee. So I hear you, I feel you, and maybe it's helpful to share that when I listen to Anthea speak about the prestigious initiative she's pursuing at the Smithsonian or see the incredibly inspiring work John is doing at La Plaza, I clearly can't replicate that at our Western Neighborhoods Project level. However, it's like finding a recipe online and um, scouring your kitchen for ingredients and then replicating that dish with what you have on hand. And I, I think that sometimes the idea is all you need to cook up something great. So we do hope to address scalability today, but I do encourage everyone to approach this program with that context in mind and ask all the questions you can think of because how often do you get the directors of La Plaza and the National Museum of American History literally in your living rooms? <laughs> So without further ado, let's move forward with what we're all here to be part of, which is a conversation with Anthea and John. Thank you both for being here today. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> so um, thanks, John. To Good to see you, Anthea. Um, Thank you both. Um, to kick us off, let's talk about how our unique state catalyzes what we all do, um, because how we're rooted necessarily impacts our vision for the future. And as Californians, I'm, I'm really interested to know how the Golden State has influenced both your leadership styles and how that's impacted the initiatives you're pursuing. So let's start with Anthea. You have uh, experiences throughout our great state. And I would love to know how those experiences are now reflected on a national stage. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. And um, I want to just make sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, I know this we're probably a little zoomed out, so um, let's see. Anthea dropped out. Can you hear me now? You're good. Got you now. I'm good. Okay. All right. As long as David Gallagher can hear me, I'm set. Um, it's an it's an honor to be in community with you, and um, I'm I'm very grateful. And thank you for that first question, Nicole. Um, I think is uh, a wonderful indication of the way in which certainly uh, I've brought a bit of California um, uh, to uh, Washington and to the Smithsonian outside of the National Museum of the American Indian. It was not common practice at all. Um, to give a land acknowledgement, which, as you know, for um, for us in this incredible, complicated, layered landscape narrative, um, as a third generation Californian, which is not a lot, um, but as a K through PhD public school girl in California, I mean, this this incredible layered place of beauty and pain and richness influences. Um, influenced certainly my path as a public historian and a public servant and an advocate, um, as well as it continues to influence today. And I've been so fortunate, whether it be working for local governments or with um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation or my beloved California Historical Society to, to do what I'm doing now, which of course is to, to create the best and the most vibrant and the most um, meaningful collaborations with incredible colleagues across the Smithsonian campus, if you will, but really across the nation and those partnerships with the state of California and Stanford and the Getty and the universities of California and the Cal States um, have been uh, so inspiring as well as all of our nonprofit partners uh, throughout uh, California. So I, I really do feel, and, and I, th I hope John and I will have a chance to, to mention some of our work together including our uh, at Plaza for a while. 
able to build this project. I, I want to feel like I brought it all with me um, to create a corny California insiders joke. It's like they rolled across the country. I said that once in, in the, in, at, this, at a Smithsonian meeting, they're all like, the great burrito of your life. I'm like, okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> It's kind of a California joke, but um, whether it be our new, we have a new language justice platform, um, all of our work at the National Museum now will be bilingual with English and Spanish, um, whether it's infusing that sense of social justice, and um, they will Good. How are you? We'll talk about um, uh, on this call in terms of in this modern, modern moment. Um, it's also a deep respect for the collections and the stewardship and the scholarship as well as the silences in the collections. Um, and then, you know, culminating in the fact that I got to create a, a, new, uh, a new strategic plan and a new tactical plan. So I, I feel my, I, I, I hope I, I bring that a kind of sense of that perspective um, to my work every day. And what I've also appreciated about you and how you approach your work is that you always bring along, you 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 raise everyone up with you on your along your. Hope so. <laughs> and I hear that you brought Nina Simon with you to Washington D.C. who to do some work for you as well. I I, I did yeah you know I, we didn't get to work together as much, ironically in California of course I knew you and so admired her work. But to kick off our strategic plan, which is the first 10 year plan, it's the first one really ground up, kind of built by staff, made by staff. And of course then to have Nina and her great team create an of by for all uh, specialized um, experience for us, our of by for all boot camp was one of the most powerful ways we could kick off um, a, a plan with a big, there's a lot of things that are incredible about that, but there means that there's a lot of relationships, right? To bind us to, uh, together, a lot of sense of healing and a lot of need to come together, but then look out, right? To really think about audiences in new and different ways. And there was no one better to do that with on a national scale. Um, Well, Anthea, we're, we're having problems with your video and audio. Maybe if you turn your video off, um, not that we don't want to see your beautiful face, but. <laughs> um, and my back now? Yeah, and your, and your incredible back. Oh, so I'm partial to. Um, <clears throat> maybe we can pivot to talking about how you reach out and collaborate across the country by talking about your uh, partnership with La Plaza. John, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm also a native Californian uh, to the Los Angeles area, second, uh, second generation. And uh, I came to La Plaza uh, six years ago. Now we were in our fourth year and I came from a non-museum uh, background uh, in that my background was primarily in uh, public relations. I had a public relations firm in Pasadena uh, for uh, about over almost 25 years. Okay, thank you, yeah. And thank you, homegirl. And uh, <laughs> of course, we, we focused on the national Hispanic market. And um, when I came to La Plaza, one of the first organizations that we worked with was the California Historical Society, which had its LA office base in our office that you see behind me here. Um, and Anthea would actually come down and uh, was great to to uh, work with her and to learn from her as well. And we did, uh, we did one amazing exhibit together for uh, Pacific Standard Time in 2017 on the murals of East LA, uh, as well as a book on that. And uh, her office and staff were uh, incredible uh, uh, contributors to that, uh, co-producers of that exhibit and that book with us. So I, I thank Anthea for that because I learned a lot working with her and her team. Because coming, coming from a non-museum background, um, you know, I came in with a little different approach. Uh, two of the clients who I worked with for over 20 years, um, you know, very non-museum, of course, were uh, McDonald's and Disneyland. But what I learned a lot working with those two clients was that they were both very focused on customer satisfaction. So it was all about the customer. Um, and I just, 
basically translated that to the visitor experience that we have in museums. Um, when I came to La Plaza, I would have to say that um, we were still trying to um, figure out where we fit in the LA Museum landscape and where we fit, um, you know, in our community uh, 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 setting as well too. Um, the buildings were pretty much underutilized. We have a great facility with uh, indoor meeting rooms. We have a backyard space that accommodates up to 5,000 people uh, for outdoor events, but things were pretty quiet um, and things were pretty unstable as well too. I think we had gone through uh, five executive directors in four years by the time I got there. Um, so it was just getting people through the turnstiles that we needed to do. And how did we do that? That was really the trick. And I would have to say, as, as uh, Anthea, uh, Anthea mentioned, that the key thing for us was uh, collaboration and partnership. Um, Coming from a public relations background, you're used to working with very small budgets. You know, you're, you're scraping around. I think Jennifer can, uh, can speak to that as well, too. But you're scraping for every dollar. You're fighting with the client for dollars to do the kind of programs that you are. So I brought that kind of mentality into the organization. What can we do with the resources that we have? And how can we expand those resources by working with other uh, interested parties uh, throughout the area? So we began to do that. Uh, we began to work with other nonprofits who needed rental space that they could use. We began to work with producers, concert promoters, and others who wanted a venue that they could use to conduct events. That helped bring people into the space. It helped bring people into the space and introduce them to what we were all about, okay? So, you know, in the last five, six years, uh, we've become one of the premier uh, venue spaces in the downtown area. And um, we've also, our second goal was also to serve as a Latino uh, cultural hub for Los Angeles. And we did that there. So we're kind of the go-to place where uh, organizations come to conduct dinners and festivals and all kinds of things. So we've hosted any number of events uh, in the last few summers from the uh, Cuban American Music Festival to the Tortilla Tournament to the Mezcal Festival. A lot of great stuff, which of course all got erased this summer. Um, so there were two, two impacts to that. One is of course our vid visitorship was, was down. We, we do about 100,000 visitors a year. Uh, secondly, that was a big hit financially because uh, uh, rental events for us generate right around $300,000 a year. So that was a, a, a big hit to our, um, our bottom line. Um, but we, we uh, uh, have persevered, we've, we've transitioned, and we'll talk a little bit later about how we have uh, moved towards becoming more of a virtual museum. Uh, we will talk about that later, so hold tight for that. Um, I really, I, I admire how you've been able to make this really welcoming, uh, vibrant anchor in, in the area that you're in, and it almost feels like downtown LA, which has become so swanky and popular, has sort of come to meet you, but that you're really holding a space for your community um, amongst all this shift and change. So I just love what you do at La Plaza. And I feel like Anthea was able to do that at the California Historical Society too. Um, I'm, I'm speaking for all of my museum ladies uh, who are uh, definitely in the audience today. The CHS on Mission Street became a home for us. We came to all your events. I worked there for a bit. And um, I really admire how both of you are able to do that in your dis in your different locations. Um, and I think like this might be a good place to pause if we have any questions. Cam team, is there anybody dying to ask Anthea or John a question? I actually have something fun to pass along that a friend just texted me. <clears throat> uh, since we're talking about history and inclusion, um, I'm very happy to share the news that our new Secretary of the Interior is Deb Halland from New Mexico. Mm -hmm. She represents the Native community. Maybe some of you already knew that, but I just got word. So yeah. very, very happy. Very, very, um, quite a historical moment, mm -hmm. I think. You heard it here first, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking news at Cambridge Museum. <laughs> Are there any other? Um... That's incredible news. <laughs> Congratulations. 
Well, if there's no other questions. Can, can, just... Hello? Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you um, for um, this wonderful program. I'm actually based here in Sterling, Virginia. I'm not a member of the museum field or any cultural uh, attractions for that matter. I do work for the federal government, but what I'm talking to you about now is, uh, is outside of that scope. I'm actually interested and have been re researching extensively um, um, uh, the possibilities of establishing a new national war museum, knowing that there's, there's a new women's museum on the way, a new Latino museum on the way. I'm not gonna take everybody's valuable time about how much research. So it's very early stages. We're just volunteers. We're not even a nonprofit yet. So there's one, I've been part of this research effort. We've been talking about research and market research what with the anti-monument movement, COVID hitting um, cultural attractions big time. I'm a member of the American Alliance of Museums, so I'm, you know, I've, I'm watching what's being said about this, about redefining museums, et cetera. So my question actually is to um, your first guest is that there's actually a, um, a gallery in her museum, which is the um, Freedom Gallery. And um, uh, she speaks, um, she spoke about the, um, strategic plan that they're working on, focusing on that particular gallery and my interest mm -hmm. in the National War Museum. There's a huge effort behind the research here. How, uh, how will you look at individual galleries within the American History Museum? Mm. Oh, that's a great question, sir. Thank you. And um, I just want to give, give a, a shout out to all, all of you who do research in the field. As you know, it's such a vast the American set of experiences is, is so deep and, and uh, longer, larger, and you know, more varied, more beautiful, and more horrible, to quote James Baldwin. So the Price of Freedom Gallery that you mentioned is, is, a, is a critical experience um, in the museum's east wing. Um, the museum is about 800,000 square feet, and uh, the first three main floors of that are mostly a, a exhibition space as well as some behind the scenes um, space. So I would love to be in contact. We'll put all my contact information um, in the chat and um, for you to, um, uh, to connect with our historians who, who study the, uh, the history of the military, which are an amazing uh, small, but great part of my uh, curatorial co cohort. Um, but I, I think you're so right as we look at the, um, um, as we look at the long span of the history of war, which is also, of course, the history of culture, the history of diplomacy, the history of territory, the history of, of, um, of so much, right, of invention and innovation, um, we take a, I think we take a pretty broad look at um, the role of, of military and military life um, uh, in, the, in the nation, and especially that, that has also been helpful for me in California, um, because California is uh, of course has rich native history, but has also flown under three flags. Um, so I think we have a, a depth of understanding, but we'll be looking, sir, to, um, uh, you know, so many of those big exhibitions, that's I think a 10, 15,000 square foot exhibition, um, need to be refreshed and updated, you know, every 15 or 20 years. So um, I'd love to be, yeah, her audio cut out. <laughs> like, what's the yeah. response to our current industries of um, uh, of the military on the west and in the territories and um, in the South Pacific? But yeah. I'm, oh, sorry, yeah. I said it would be great to continue the conversation with you about kind of what we do. Uh, what we do next with our, our military history work. Uh, Anthea, you're cutting out. And um, we did put Anthea's email address into the chat. So you definitely can continue this that offline. Um, and actually, you provided us with a perfect introduction to our next Q&A section. Thank you so much for um, that wonderful dialogue. Um, our next kind of little section segment of this of this casual chat is a, actually a question for both John and Anthea um, around the fact the phrase museums are not neutral, which has been in play for a few years now. Um, but the ethos behind this has really taken on new dimensions in 2020. So 
I want to know from both of you, how do you see the role of particularly a national history museum and a regional cultural organization changing over the course of this pandemic? And um, again, I see that Anthea has popped up. So John, why don't we start with you? Um, mm -hmm. I know La Plaza is leading opposition to an LA City Council proposal to rename part of Figueroa Street. And um, I, I think this speaks to, to find the right balance between how we meet this historic moment um, with issues like social justice in play and the erasure of history in play without choosing sides which is what a lot of people think museums should be, is neutral. But how do you not choose sides anymore as your museum uh, uh, continues to take on um, a more of an advocacy role? Well, uh, I would say that, you know, social justice and uh, telling the untold stories of the Latino presence in Los Angeles is, that's what we're all about. That's, that's uh, part of our DNA. So we focus on that a lot and many of the exhibits that we do, even the art exhibits, focus on themes of social justice. When we did an exhibit several years ago on uh, baseball in Los Angeles, uh, it really, really focused on the social impact of baseball. So it wasn't just about who the great players were and which ones went on to the majors and the Dodgers, but it was about how baseball was used as a tool for social, social change in Los Angeles when Latino teams uh, couldn't utilize local parks and they couldn't join the other clubs. So that was a great, a great story that we, that we told and I learned a lot about that. Um, we also have an exhibit right now that just kind of um, uh, coincidentally opened three weeks before the shutdown on the Afro-Latino experience in Los Angeles. So that's you know, often, uh, uh, an often looked uh, segment of the community that we wanted to, to put the spotlight on. Uh, so that was very well received, and we hope to continue that exhibit um, when we do we open, whenever, whenever that uh, date may be. You know, our organization is um, uh, pretty well politically aligned, board and staff, and I don't think I have to tell you which way that would be, but I could say that uh, if I had proposed to the board that we paint the buildings blue up until November, they would have agreed to that most likely, you know? So we're all, and we're all kind of politically involved on, on the <laughs> side too. Um, so when you ask how far we can go, well, I think many organizations did this. Um, we did our job in uh, uh, posting voter education and voter registration announcements on all of our social media. We had a window display in our building that you see there. Uh, encouraging uh, people to vote. Um, so we were part of that network of organizations that got very involved in uh, getting people into the political system, which of course is especially important in our community. The other thing that, uh, that uh, we've been doing that uh, you referenced, Nicole, is extending what we do outside of our four walls, okay? And I think that's an important role that uh, museums can play. And I actually got involved with this issue when I received a call from uh, a curator at the uh, Museum of Natural History uh, telling me that uh, the City Council of LA was uh, proposing to rename a section of Figueroa Street for Kobe Bryant. Mm -hmm. uh, Figueroa Street is one of the longest streets in the city. It runs almost 30 miles. Uh, the original three mile section of it was named in 1857 for Governor Jose Figueroa, okay? Uh, governor Figueroa was considered to be one of the most competent governors during the Mexican rule of California. Uh, he was in office just for a short time. He died very young. Uh, he died while he was in office, but he was uh, governor from about 1833 to 1835. And most importantly, one of the most important things that he did was uh, oversaw the secularization of the missions in the state. And his proposal, his manifesto that he wrote, which was the first book published in California, proposed giving half of the land to Native Americans, okay? Um, and as you know, uh, unfortunately, when, when uh, Governor Figueroa died, uh, that plan was not implemented and uh, Native American communities were pretty much left uh, empty-handed. So it uh, could have been a whole different uh, California that we're looking at if his plan had been implemented. That's an important part of our history. And that's part of what we stand for. Uh, we didn't want to see that 
erased, even if it was only a three mile section, we didn't wanna see his name dismembered um, and we didn't wanna see that happen in the future for, for uh, other potential renaming opportunities on Figueroa Street. So we've joined a coalition that includes uh, historians in town. Uh, it includes the Figueroa uh, Merchants Association. There's been a lot of redevelopment in that area as well. That's the area right in front of Staples Center, of course, where, where Kobe fly, uh, played. And we proposed a compromise to rename uh, the intersection right in front of Staples for Kobe, okay? So we're um, attempting to talk to the uh, city council member who proposed that. Um, we uh, haven't had any luck doing that yet, but we're not going to let up. Uh, we brought other people into the coalition and uh, we also uh, co-wrote an opinion column that was published in the LA Times uh, two weeks ago that kind of made our case for that. So that's, uh, that's an important role that, that we've assumed. Um, and again, extending beyond the four, four walls of our organization, but out into the greater community as a kind of a guardian and defender of our history. Uh, another quick example of how that's come up um, for the last two weeks, the LA Times has had a story that refers to the removal of hundreds or thousands of um, uh, Chicano families to make way for the Dodgers and Chavez Ravine. Mm -hmm. Well, that's popular history, but it's not factual history, you know? And that myth has persisted through the years. The fact is, is that that land was empty for five years except for one family. And that one family got a lot of attention. Uh, when they were when they were moved out when the Dodgers uh, took over, so we're always on the lookout for uh, for factual uh, errors like that that we think uh, need to be corrected. Sometimes not necessarily in our favor either, but uh, just want to we just want to set the record straight. The, and that's a perfect way to explain how I think museums have been pushed a little bit beyond their comfort zone, if you will, um, to, to, to move beyond our four walls, but to also kind of take a stand on things. I know up in San Francisco right now, we're dealing with two movements um, that to remove monuments that are um, no longer culturally relevant or perhaps offensive, and then to rename some schools in San Francisco. And so at Western Neighborhoods Project, we're trying to delve into that and have conversations about that. And what I've noticed in a lot of the schools that are named after controversial figures in hindsight is that they were named arbitrarily for, with no context. Just one board of supervisor decided, you know what, we should have some more history names up in San Francisco. So once people learn that that context is there, they're more willing to let go of something um, that might not be mm -hmm. relevant anymore. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, we're finding that up here too. Yeah. And Anthea, it's good to have Anthea's you back. back. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. Oh. I've been moving around trying to find better <laughs> Wi-Fi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I've heard I've heard everything. I just realized you couldn't hear me. And for that, uh, for the gentleman um, uh, interested in military history, I hope I made it clear that uh, it's an incredibly important, very complex uh, part of our curatorial presence. And I'd love to to take up the conversation with them, but. Um, and John, thank you too. Uh, your work at La Plaza um, is woven into uh, Margie Salazar Par uh, Porzio's work on Playbol, which was supposed mm -hmm. to open uh, yeah. in October, um, from the Barrios to the Big Leagues, which will um, open uh, in the museum, we hope, spring break, maybe spring training, mm -hmm. um, and then travel around the nation. Um, again, for that, for the importance of telling the deep and, and rich and complicated uh, stories of not only the, the Latinx um, uh, layers of history, uh, but embracing too um, the incredible mixture that we've always been. Um, as you know, the Pobladores of Los Angeles were an incredibly mixed group with a significant Afro Mestiza um, uh, proportion. And then some of the, the great work that, um, that we did at CHS, again, heavily partnered work and led two by Jessica Howe, who was so instrumental with uh, Miradas um, and a great team, Al Camarillo at, at Stanford uh, to, to bring back to life. You know, a lot of what we're doing is restorative and, and it's a reclamation project, right? It's, it's kind of reclaiming history. It's taking it up again and looking through it. 
Um, and uh, it's it's such a, a powerful thing to work on projects um, such as Juana Briones that, that we did um, at CHS. But you know, onto the museums are not neutral. It is, um, it's a phenomenal moment. Um, you know, I too am in a way an accidental museum director. Uh, I've long, you know, done my work pu in public with, uh, with uh, my life as an historian, but it was really my time at CHS, uh, as well as my training too in, in archives and oral history and historic oh, preservation. Oh, before we do that, here. Oh, maybe we want to mute. I know, I'm so excited, I finally have a voice. Um, but uh, it was my work with collections and with the power of exhibitions and, and, and learning how to translate um, uh, scholarship, research, object, um, primary source material uh, into relevance. And, and I think that that still holds true today and is in, in, in particularly important uh, in this year. Um, this year that has revealed all of our cultural seismology, right? With cascading crises, whether they be viral, racial, economic, climate, they this this year has in a, in a way kind of laid them bare. And it's interesting, you know, to again, maybe that's another California thing to think of it as cultural and social and racial uh, and um, constructed seismology, uh, but it is, uh, it, it's a helpful frame for me as I think about this year and I think about the position, whether it be of a local uh, museum or um, community nonprofit or the National Museum and the importance of recognizing um, the moments we're in, whether that's formally recognizing um, uh, the, the anguish and grief, especially after the killing of George Floyd, or whether that's acknowledging now that the unprecedented uh, toll of, of COVID-19 on communities and then the disproportionate impact, of course, uh, on communities of, of color. So it is a, um, it's a phenomenal honor to try and figure out how to understand, contextualize, document, um, help people remember. So many of us are doing kind of oral history and digital collecting projects right now across the nation. Uh, especially a number of them here in California, uh, encouraging people, you know, to share their stories, their stories of 2020, and and helping us, you know, not forget, but also using history, culture, art, science, museums as places now of of um, digital community, as we await the time um, when they can be our physical communities again, and I think be bridges into constructing uh, hopefully a new reality uh, for our, our post-COVID uh, our post-COVID world. So it's, I feel that, I feel that kind of that honor. It's so true, uh, it's an honor. It's also an immense responsibility. I <laughs> the glorious I, burden, yeah. Yeah, um, it is a glorious <laughs> burden. Um, I, I keep referring to this year as historic, which is kind of a PR spin to, you know, situate historians in a point of relevance, but it's also museums have this responsibility to um, be arbiters of this discussion, create safe sp spaces, um, provide emotional support for people who are trying to to work their way through this historic moment. And, and at the same time as you know, technical professionals, we've all had to figure out all of a sudden how to be totally virtual. And I know both of you have been doing incredibly dynamic work. Um, John, you've been able to shift your entire uh, programming online with great success. Maybe you can speak to that. Sure. Um, yeah, we have been doing that uh, almost immediately since the uh, since the shutdown. We we had uh, an exhibit reception scheduled for a new show by uh, the Chicano artist Carlos Amadas, who's considered one of the you know top Chicano mm -hmm. artists of the time, um, and in fact has a, uh, a great documentary on Netflix right now. Um, so uh, we had to cancel that reception the week before because the lockdown went into place that night. And what we decided to do uh, was do a live walkthrough of the exhibit with his wife um, and the curator. Um, so we, uh, we did that uh, you know, with our cell phone cameras and a shaky internet, but it worked. And we looked at each other, uh, my marketing director and I said, 
you know, that worked. That, that wasn't so bad. It didn't cost us anything and it went well. Um, and it still uh, lives on our YouTube page. So based on that, we decided to launch a program that we call En Casa con la Plaza. And uh, we do that three times a week. And we had our 100th episode of that uh, last uh, Friday night. Um, so uh, the schedule basically is that Monday we do a cooking show with one of our great local chefs. And then Wednesday night, we, we can uh, have a guest on, a politician, a historian, an author, a uh, musician. You know, there's a lot of talent that doesn't get exposure in our community. So it's a great way to give them exposure. Last night, we had um, a program with Yolanda Nava, who was a news reporter all her career and uh, wrote a book and is writing a new book on her experience with losing her sight uh, late in life. Um, so that book is coming out in March. Uh, we also have entertainers on um, and we have uh, this Friday night, this is a plug, but why not? Um, we have a show with Dan Goretto, who is the son of uh, Lalo Goretto, who you may know was the, was the father of Chicano music. Uh, and Friday night, Dan is going to have uh, Louis Perez from Los Lobos, uh, Anthea's favorite band on, as well as uh, your neighbor, uh, Linda Ronstadt as well too. Um, so we've had Edward James Olmos and uh, other uh, celebrities talking about their careers and the issues that they're involved in. So it's been a great, great program. It's not hard to do. It's not expensive to do. Um, we get about 1,500 to 2,000 uh, viewers. Um, what we found now, too, is that we're also creating many oral histories because these segments now live on our YouTube page. So we have all segments on our, on our YouTube page that people uh, can go back to. Uh, we then expanded with our education team and we do another series called En Familia con la Plaza. Okay, and uh, we have a great team of uh, gardening and culinary experts who do uh, many workshops for uh, school age kids that airs on uh, Saturday afternoons. And then the other thing that we've done is um, we're moving all of our uh, exhibits to a virtual platform as well too. Um, and we recently uh, purchased a uh, Matterport uh, 360 camera, which you know allows you to zoom into everything. It's really cool. It's a very uh, nifty little tool that we can use now. Uh, so we, we have, I think, three of our exhibits on that now uh, on our, our website and on uh, YouTube, too. So we've moved to the virtual platform. We, of course, did our annual fundraiser virtually well on, as well. Uh, and that went well. We found that, uh, you know, our costs were about a third of what it would have been if we had to, uh, to feed people. And we, uh, you know, we raised almost as much money. So, um, you know, we'll probably uh, do that to some extent uh, again next year. So that's been one of the benefits that's come out of all this is that we've adapted to the virtual realities of the day. And uh, when we do reopen, whenever that day comes, we will continue to do as much as we can on, on a virtual platform. That is a wonderful point that what we're learning today, I've heard the joke of like, oh, when we return to normal, when we uh, no longer have to be on Zoom, we'll probably all finally understand how to function on Zoom. But the truth is that this virtual element to the work that we do will always be part of our work. And um, I know personally, we, we shifted our oral history program to Zoom and it's actually way better. We have an automatic recording video and audio that yep. takes very little production work. And um, that's really been for us, the storytelling yep. aspect of this pandemic, of this protest, um, this moment of protest has been wonderful yep. uh, to capture as historians. It's very exciting. I know um, Anthea, the, the, Nat, the Smithsonian is doing great work around capturing and amplifying voices in this moment. Oh, well, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, John. It was great to get caught up and uh... I got to play a little role in, in your gala too, which was uh, your gala, which was wonderful. Um, so and I, I'm gonna pick up on what something what you said about Nicole about the silver linings, which I think is, you know, one way in which to contextualize what you and John have been saying. There is a democratization that happens in the virtual world. There's you can spend $150,000 producing an event for an online audience. You can spend, you know, staff time 
doing it. There's a huge range. And to your point about Zoom, which remember it started out as an educational platform and, um, and Microsoft Teams or whatever those, those, those shared platforms are, are doing, we tried to learn early from the people who were already really good at it, like our friends at the Wikimedia Foundation, right? Who, who had to operate across time zones in, vir in very virtual places on virtual shared platforms. And um, so there's the operation side of it, but in terms of the public history and public art and, and um, citizen science aspects of, the, of, of this new world, um, I go back to something that I've, I've felt for a long time working in outsized uh, groups of people. So, you know, in the Western office of the National Trust, we worked in eight Western states and, and uh, the uh, Guam and Micronesia, right? So it was this vast thing out of a tiny office. California Historical Society, same thing, small office, big state. By the way, just real quickly, when I tell folks on the East Coast that, well, you know, it stretched on the Eastern seaboard, California goes from Northern Georgia to Southern Maine, they're all like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah. So don't talk to me about, you know, scale things, but um, no. Um, but you always have to figure out how to work, especially in that last 20, 25 years in the and, right? We're very analog based people. We love holding history in our hands or touching it. Uh, a historic place or feeling the sacredness of a, of, um, of a special um, landscape. But we also have, to, we're at our best when we merge the digital and the analog and try and work you know, in that center. And that's certainly what we've done. I, I set up three task force when we shut down um, the museum. The museum is generally closed one day a year on the 25th of December. And so we, we put the big bear in hibernation starting on um, the 13th of March. And so we set up um, a scenario planning team, we set up a, um, a collecting team, and we set up um, a basically a COVID-19 digital programming team to, to really figure out kind of how do we be in these spaces. And, you know, we used to throw words around like disrupt, pivot, unprecedented, and now we know what all of those mean. Um, iterative, remember when we used iterative was kind of nice and now everything feels iterative. So we really worked hard to both pivot huge events. Uh, 2020 was supposed to be the year of the woman we were opening. We opened a, a wonderful exhibit on the a history of how we remember women's suffrage on the 6th of March. We were supposed to open Girlhood, it's complicated on the 12th of June. And so like so many of you, we had to figure out you know, how to still carry forth in, in terms of girlhood, we actually installed girlhood in the pandemic. So we learned a lot from that, but then moved and shifted almost all of our content, existing content um, uh, to digital platforms, trying to in explore the richness of those platforms. Um, but also like John, trying to figure out how to serve other, whether they be fundraising goals or programmatic goals. So uh, we've certainly learned a lot. Um, it, one of the key storytelling components back to your great comment, Nicole, uh, and to John's work as well. Um, and, and by the way, cooking, we, we, have a, we have the nation's largest collection on the history of food and um, our Food History Weekend and our Food History Gala um, centered around many things, but including of course, Julia Child's Kitchen from her Cambridge home um, is our big event of the year their only fundraiser per se. And of course it was, you know, scheduled for October. So again, you know, pivoting there, um, but our food history weekend um, focused on food and social justice um, and was able to bring forth a richness because people can participate, whether they're in Virginia or Guam right now, although it's probably the middle of the night in Guam, they could be on with us on this call, on this Zoom experience. And um, you know, taking advantage of that magnification, I think, is is really important. Um, last Friday, we did our 24 hours uh, in a time of change, where 10, 11 of the Smithsonian uh, museums and research units, like the Latino Center and the uh, Asian Pacific American Center, participated in a massive 24-hour story collecting. Uh, effort, and then we launched to the stories of 2020, which is, will be on ongoing, um, but building on everyone's great work, right? What we've all learned together about how to um, do our best work in community 
when we can't necessarily see each other and uh, hug each other, uh, have a glass of wine together, do research together, open up our archives, take in our exhibitions. And, um, uh, and so it's, um, it's quite a lot. We've also pivoted to try, and I know you guys have done a lot of this at Western Neighborhoods, to try and focus on our digital archiving, mm -hmm. right? Um, whether it be putting it, we have, you know, very uh, conservatively about 1.8 million objects and over three linear shelf miles of archives. And so um, trying to make sure that people have what they need from their working from home to continue to grow and to enhance the digitization and the, um, the intellectual, since, since we don't have a lot of physical control right now over the collection, except for monitoring and everything that we do, trying to really enhance the intellectual control of, of the collection, which I know a number of us are, you know, are, are thinking about in our collection spaces as well. Absolutely. Um, I mean, the accessibility, the possibilities for accessibility of the online realm uh, offer mm -hmm. so many wonderful opportunities, but we really do feel the absence of being able to commune around our culture and a big part yeah. of it to speak to your initiatives around food is is the recipes that we have in our families and the way that that, that we eat and, and we commune around that. And I know, right. John, one of the ways that you're able uh, to plan out in the future to connect people around the shared sense of community is an exciting new expansion for La Plaza. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, what we're actually uh, in the process of constructing right now is a new space that we call La Cocina. And that will be located in our new development across the street from uh, our existing museum, which is a residential retail complex that uh, we opened about two years ago. Um, and Los, La Cocina um, is, as far as we know, and nobody's challenged, on, challenged us on this, so we'll continue saying it, the first museum dedicated to uh, Mexican cuisine in the country, if not the world. Um, so it'll be a space where we'll have a teaching kitchen where we can do talks and demonstrations, cooking classes, workshops. Uh, we can bring in virtual presentations from Mexico and other cities. We'll have, of course, an exhibition area. We'll have a small store and we'll have a tortilla comal around grill where we'll be able to make fresh tortillas and some limited uh, uh, tortilla based products. Um, so that is literally under construction as we speak as of last week. We hope to have that up and running uh, by June, July. And you know, uh, food is such an important part of our, of our culture. Um, and it's the greatest gift that Mexico has given to the world. And it's so, Mexican food is so diverse, you know? So we wanna get away from this concept of, of, of Taco Bellness and uh, really show people how flavorful and colorful and diverse Mexican cuisine is. And here in LA, of course, we, we are the Mexican food capital of the country and we have many, many uh, chefs who have come up and opened restaurants here or have come here to work. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to, to showcase them. So we're very excited about, about getting that, uh, that space up and running. And uh, my next stop will be to uh, check up on construction to see how we're, how we're doing, make sure we're on schedule. I'm so excited for this space. I grew up in LA and so Mexican food is totally my comfort food. And I think you guys have totally nailed a central role for museums of being this place of comfort, of being this place of cultural connection. Um, and I, but at the same time, um, we can speak to the duality of museums by talking about how museums have to push us kind of out of our comfort zone. And Anthea, I know that the Smithsonian received a huge grant, $25 million grant from Bank of America mm -hmm. to explore how Americans understand and experience and confront racism, um, impeccably timed in June of this year. And this is a yeah. really huge and important topic. And I know we're running low on time, but I would love to hear more about how you're approaching that and how it connects, how it can, how it can scale toward, to all of our museums across California. Sure. Um, thank you so much for asking that. I feel particularly um, grateful. I wasn't, I was brought into the Smithsonian by Dr. David Scorton, but within um, a couple of months, um, uh, 
uh, Lonnie G. Bunch III became the, the Smithsonian secretary. So of course, Lonnie has his intellectual roots in California working for um, the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, and as well as at the Natural His uh, the National um, uh, Museum of American History and Chicago. And then of course, being the remarkable founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's been such a gift to work for the first African-American, the first historian and the first former museum director in modern times um, under Lonnie. And this is really Lonnie's um, kind of incredible presence and power and vision to create the race community in our shared future initiative, which Think America, as you uh, noted, is a, is a remarkable and incredibly generous uh, supporter of. Um, and that will take um, that will take shape in um, what I hope we can um, share with, with you all soon in a series of national convenings to understand the ways in which um, the areas of race, race and wellness, race and wealth, you know, race and community, race and education um, have worked um, to, um, uh, to create this powerful but very uneven landscape of access uh, and of equity. And so it's, I'm on the, I don't, I have a, I have a direct role on that. I'm on the kind of the senior advisory uh, committee. And um, one of my staff has been detailed uh, to uh, the initiative, which is, which is incredible, but um, it's a really, it's a remarkable opportunity for us to, uh, to see the Smithsonian as maybe the nation's uh, convener around these important and, as you said, very difficult conversations. So I'm deeply looking forward to that. It'll take on many forms. It'll be a kind of an umbrella too for some of the initiatives that many of the 19 museums and 11 research institutes are working on in different ways. And it'll also be a challenge to us internally to change. We come from a colonial, you know, imperial uh, founding um, and we still wrestle with all of the same tensions uh, that um, the hegemonic power structure of the nation wrestles with. Um, so we see this as a, as a truly remarkable opportunity and whether we're talking about like our, we do a program on the history of philanthropy and this year we're supposed to focus on educational equity. And what's amazing for a lot of us, maybe it's affirming and, uh, and um, challenging uh, and also sad at the same time. When you, when you pick these topics a year ago or two years ago that you know 2020, we were gonna focus on women and equity or we're gonna focus on education and, and race and equity. And then you actually get to produce and then experience the, the programs and the conversations. Um, as you know, it just takes on a whole new level of, um, of, of power and of, um, of resonance that I think we're all trying to work towards. So, um, so yeah, so I'm thrilled about the race community and our shared future initiatives website will launch maybe as soon as tomorrow. Um, so I'll make sure I, I keep you all um, uh, informed as well. And then I would love for everyone across California in particular, because we are um, path, uh, path breaking in so many ways to take a look too at the, at the major themes of the initiative and to see kind of how can we be part of the conversation, right? How can we pull the, the long and complicated uh, and very diverse histories of, of the nation um, into a conversation about the complications of race because we experience uh, uh, race differently throughout this amazing state. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a perfect way to kind of like tie a little bow on this amazing session is <laughs> That the role of museums is not to speak at you, to not to not to speak for you, it's to have conversations with each other. And um, John at La Plaza, you do that actively every day in in your advocacy, in in the way you approach your work. And Anthea, you of course as well have always been such an inspiration to um, particularly us museum ladies, but to everybody in every organization <laughs> that you've been part of. And I hope that we have a little more time. Maybe um, my CAM colleagues can give me the thumbs up if we can allow for some q and I know we've gone a little long. Getting I'm, I'm fine. I can, I can have absolutely stay on, but I know that maybe some of you have to go. <laughs> I, I just want to say how uh, how great it is to have uh, Anthea in her position there, a, a real Californian uh, heading up the museum, and then with uh, someone who's probably a Californian at heart uh, heading the whole organization. That's that's big progress. That's just great. 
Oh, thank you. It's an honor to represent. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I know too that one of the things that Anthea mentioned to me that uh, she initiated uh, there at the museum uh, recently was to uh, install bilingual signage at the museum, yeah. you know? Um, and so it, it took someone with, with that kind of orientation to just make that happen, which is why that's yeah. so important that she you, said. John. Thank you so any, much. Did we have any questions? Otherwise, I can also talk about how inspiring Anthea is. Um, for days, probably. Um, <laughs> no, no, don't. Yeah. But really, both of you, I have to say, in planning this session, um, you know, it, I'm the new kid on the director block here, and you are very esteemed colleagues of mine now. And John, immediately, you put me at ease by, you know, um, chatting about our mutual hometown, which is nice, Temple City. Yeah. Yes. That, yes. <laughs> Ooh, give it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And Anthea as well, I mean, when you were at CHS, no one felt like they were, um, everyone felt like they were part of the family. And so I, no. I appreciate- Well, you, you are and you were, so. <laughs> um, so do we have any questions I'm trying to go through? Do we have any questions or would anyone like to open their mic to um, address personally either of our illustrious speakers today? Great. There was one question that I wanted to be sure and, and catch. Um, this is from Michael Lang, and he wants to know, or she wants to know, excuse me, um, how you deal with copyright when you're doing so much online. Do you ever have any trouble mm -hmm. with, with um, dealing with copyright? copyright yes, we certainly have. Uh, we've learned how to navigate that. Uh, you cannot use recorded music. You, there is, you can go through and of course get a license fee for that, uh, which is a little prohibitive for our cost. So the way we do it now is you can use um, uh, live recordings. Okay, so if we have concert recordings for a musician or group, we can use that. Uh, but, to, but to use something that is recorded uh, on an album CD, um, you can get dinged and we have been dinged for that too because uh, they're very aggressive about monitoring that. And we've actually had programs where they have stepped in onto that live stream, not only deleted that segment, but then deleted the entire program. So you've got to be mm -hmm. very, very careful about that. Yeah, you know, and I, I think maybe um, the question might go two ways, right? How you have to be careful in the digital space with, um, uh, with, uh, op especially if if you're using um, any kind of copyrighted um, material, and I think that the AAM has some good guidelines on producing um, uh, digitally in this in this new way. So check those, and and I can send you some links too. Um, on the other side of that, I think it behooves all of us, and we're in a, I think the you know privilege uh, space in this to make as much of our as many of our collections available. Um, we pushed out um, at launch 2.8 million um, digital items from the Smithsonian collection when we launched our open access uh, project in February, you know, with a big launch and a big party, because of course we did big launches and big parties in February. Um, but it, um, uh, and we launched them into the Creative Commons, um, which I know some of you, you know, you might, smaller institutions might rely more on uh, the fees that you might get from licensing your own images. Um, but I think open access is something that, again, has been brought even with the long conversation, you know, 20, 25 year conversation. But we're certainly trying to figure out ways that the Smithsonian can give all of, all of you uh, as much access as possible in a very 21st century way um, uh, through the Creative Commons and especially Creative Commons Zero, right? Which is um, trying to truly make these images and um, digital facsimiles as available as possible. Um, but it's a good question and just try and navigate it carefully. You know, for smaller organizations, you know, you can also ask the bigger ones how they do it. For those of us who have attorneys, either on our board or on our staffs, um, you know, we've, we've figured out a lot of that. So, um, uh, I can be sure and follow up with you on that. But John's absolutely right to kind of go with the, 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 the chewiest, most difficult is going to be uh, intellectual property like music. Well, um, 
Full yeah. disclosure, Michael works for the Bancroft and she is actively helping Western Neighborhoods Project navigate this very problem with our- Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, well, I'll loop back to you guys then. Yeah, well, the Bancroft, I was gonna say, then talk to some of the big ones, like, you know, State Library, Bancroft, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think we could collectively push for, um, you know, we, we, um, we did this at CHS too, you know, it's like, why hold these collections on behalf of, of the people of California or the people of the nation if you can't make them accessible. So um, again, try and figure out, try and, you know, there is a lot of music um, that is available um, uh, online. Um, and then there's a lot of mm -hmm. historic recordings as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I'm happy to follow up with that. Yeah, and of course that, that applies, applies to uh, movie clips as well too. Right. I know the Getty uh, un unleashed upon all of us history nerds, the Ed Ruscha archive of photographs. Yes. About, oh my gosh. We, um, so many of my little nerd pod just like went bonkers for that. And um, to uh, maybe plug my own organization a, a little teeny bit here, uh, Open SF History was developed as an auxiliary program of Western Neighborhoods Project with this sort of right. like open source archive. This is the people's history. Let them have it. Um, um uh, yeah. ethos and um we we rely heavily on fair use we also don't monetize anything so um and right. thank you michael publicly for um enabling us to navigate these treacherous waters with such grace <laughs> i thought mike i thought michael lang was a copyright librarian <laughs> smart <laughs> question yeah well nicole you guys have done you and david and woody and so you know you've done such an amazing job showing us that you know showing the way on that too um, in terms of get the gift back to communities, kind of of their own history, right? It's like, yeah. Um, but you're right, navigating fair use is something we should just all kind of be in a big, you know, a big conversation about. Uh, and I know that especially archivists and copyright librarians are uh, on the cutting edge of this. Um, and pub ones at public institutions like the Bancroft or, you know, uh, quasi-public like the Smithsonian, um, uh, you know, are, are, should really be in the, in the, in the lead on that so that others then you can kind of, you know, tuck under the, tuck under the wings, so. Yes, I mean, shout out to small museums is that the smaller you are, the easier you can just like do it. Um, uh, we yeah. don't, we obviously have a board that navigates what we do, but um, we can just sort of hail Mary and, and put the program out there, throw spaghetti at the wall, like I've been saying all year with, and try it out with um, minimal, um, uh, issues not like on your level where you, well you're just in a different sphere <laughs> I know sometimes trust me I wish you know uh, speaking of the Golden Gate Bridge and you know, I first came to CHS and we needed to do an exhibition which, which we didn't have a curator and that's you know that's when we started working actively with Jessica Howe who was an, a contemporary art curator um, but when I tell my Smithsonian friends that we put together an exhibition with 250 objects on the history of the Golden Gate Bridge in, le in like three months, they're like, it, it, you know, you're right. You can work at, you can kind of work at a warp speed. Yeah. Um, and that's what one of my hope for all of the smaller organizations. And I know we've got um, some great colleagues uh, with us and some that whom I had the honor of working with like Amanda Meeker in Sacramento and Ann Peterson in Santa Barbara. Um, we all need to come together to survive these times so that we can then make it through, make it through intact, um, support each other through this, um, and then figure out the best ways, you know, to share our resources and continue to move forward. Because we're gonna, the United States is gonna need its history more than ever and need us to be involved in issues of how to um, stem back the tides of both ignorance and anti-science, um, uh, how to proactively use heritage as a way in arts and culture as a way to try and um, reduce our carbon emissions, right? To try, try and use the tactic, not just like, oh, we could have a meeting at an art museum or, oh, we could have a meeting at the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. No, but to use what we have learned in the arts and culture and history and science communities um, on ways to motivate people, on ways to include people, on ways to make it think that it's their world and, and, and that their activism and their agency matters rather than something that's kind of big and awful and being done unto them. Okay. And um, 
and you know we just have a lot of we have a lot of collective work to do between 20 really between now and 2030 2050. Speaking of existential crises, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, well, the more work that you both do with your organizations around academic and non-academic subjects like baseball, which is also very close to my heart, and food, I think the more uh, the more relevant our organizations will become. Um, I want to thank both of you for being here today. This feels like a good place to wrap it up. Um, and I think we have dropped links into the chat where you can donate and support the work that John is doing at La Plaza, support the work that Anthea is doing oh. at the National Media support, support, the, support California work for me first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, John and Anthea, I wanted to give you one last moment to um, promote any specific initiative or um, like John, that Linda Ronstadt uh, program is on my radar for Friday. Um, <laughs> but if there's anything else you'd like to leave us with, I will give you the floor. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, well, there is a, a uh, if you're, there's a Sunday program, the second program that we're doing uh, that the, the, the big Smithsonian as I call it is doing uh, as part of the race community and our shared future. Um, uh, initiative and it's focusing on youth activism, which I think will, will be really remarkable. I can try and grab it as, as John wraps up. Um, but I guess the best thing you can do for all of, for me um, and for all of my colleagues at, um, at the Smithsonian um, is to let us know, you know, let us know how we can best help you uh, through these trying unprecedented, uh, you know, very, uh, very difficult times. Um, and, and know that we're there in partnership and community and solidarity with you. Wonderful. Great. And I would just say for, you know, for the coming year, um, I think most organizations are going to be looking at things now through that social justice uh, prism. Uh, that, e that, I mean, that even applies to organizations like us because we were founded as a museum of primarily Mexican and Mexican American history but we've now expanded that to include uh, uh, certainly Central Americans who, who play a big, uh, big role in, in the community as well. And looking at other segments that have been overlooked, whether it's Latino, LGBTQ, uh, certainly women, uh, and we, we wanna do more uh, in the Native American uh, area as well too. So we'll be looking at all those things. I think uh, we're gonna be pretty, Quiet the next two weeks. Uh, to, no, tomorrow night is our last in Casa for the for the year, so we're going out with a bang uh, with Linda, and then we'll be back with a, a full slate of programs uh, in the coming year. One of the other things that uh, we've been involved with as well is uh, in the formation of a new group called the Latinx uh, Arts Alliance, and that's an organization of the five major. Uh, Latino mm -hmm. cultural arts organizations in LA. So mm -hmm. we're up and running with the website and the idea is to uh, jointly promote everything that we're doing and work more oh, uh, collaborative, collaboratively yeah. as well. I'd love to, are you gonna include the Cheech too out in Riverside? We will, yeah, once, uh, yeah. once, yeah. yeah. Once and I know they're still getting, I still know that's still nascent, but exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I'd love yeah. to do that too. We just are, my, curatorial team um, is creating a kind of a Latinx commons for our work um, that span we just our, our newest curatorial hire is a curator of, of Latinx military history so anyway, oh. it, it's a it's a you know and you know some of our curators as, as well so anything right. we can do just let us know and if you want to if uh, you want to do another six hour program we can do another program on the term latinx and uh, yes please how that is or the uh, new the national museum of the history of the american latino it's like what happened to the latinas yeah oh i know because yeah many many people don't even use latinx is that too academic and yeah i know yeah we're wrestling with that as well yeah so. Yeah. Well, we've yeah. wrestled with a lot this year, and I think we all have, <laughs> continue um, to. Yeah, we all have earned a nice holiday break, however you celebrate those holidays. Um, again, once again, John and Anthea, oh my gosh, what an amazing uh, year ending event for CAM. Um, thank you so much. And I will uh, do one final plug for the California Association of Museums. You know, if you like this program, we've got plenty of more where this came from and membership starts at the low, low price of $15 a year. I really hope that number was correct. Um, yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs>
um, of which of course John is an intimate part of as a member of our board. So um, Lacey just dropped a, a membership link in the chat. I, I encourage all of you oh, great. members and um, I think that'll about do it for us today. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you sure. all so much. Thank you, John, for, for being in conversation with me and for being such a dear friend. Great to see you. And thank you, Cam. Yes. Good to see you. Merriest of everything. Happy Here's to 2021. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> happy and safe holidays, everyone. Yes. Take a break if yeah. you can. Take a little break. Yes. Yes, please. Mama Patrilla's pizza for me, John. Okay.